Galatians 6. The portion of scripture that we're going to look at here this evening is a very well-known passage. It's our memory verse that we're learning right now, again, uh, that we went over this morning. I hope you take some time. It's Galatians 6, 7 is our memory verse. It says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. So you know the verse, and again, I mentioned it this morning. You probably know the verse. You've had it memorized for years. But this verse, and I found it interesting, as you look at Galatians 6, 7, you're probably familiar, if, if you're anything like me, you're probably familiar with this verse more used as a threat. Are, you know what I'm saying? My mom used to come and she would say this when my brother and I were, were when I, I'll put it this way, when I was being mean to my brother, uh, which didn't happen often, but when it did, my mom would come up to me and she'd say, Ben, what you sow, you're going to reap. And it was used kind of as a threat where if I keep doing this, it's, it's going to come back around, right? That was kind of, and that's kind of how we've gotten used to hearing this. Well, you, you reap what you sow. We hear about somebody who, you know, some politician who got away with it for a long time and then all of a sudden gets caught up with him and we say, ha ha, you reap what you sow. We, we view it that way. But I want us to notice that if we're looking at this in its context, there's actually some pretty tremendous blessing associated with this principle of sowing and reaping. And so we're going to look at it here this evening in light of that. Probably the reason that we do view it as we do is because this passage, this verse even, starts off with a warning. Look at verse 7, the first part of the verse. It says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Why does God give us warnings in Scripture? Well, because he knows our tendencies. Why do they put up guardrails in particular places? Well, because they know that people go there and they lean out too far and they're liable to, to, to fall or to drop their possessions or whatever it is. God knows our tendencies, and so he gives us warnings in Scripture. And here he does. He says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. To, to, to be deceived means to roam, to go astray, to be seduced. He says, hey, look, you need to be careful because our tendency is to wander off the path. We sing the song, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. We sing in one of the verses, we say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. We know how that is. You come to church, you get right with the Lord, you, you're having your devotions Monday morning and Tuesday morning you wake up and you're a ball of fire and then Wednesday you wake up and you think, well, you know what, it's not that important, I can do something else first and you end up wandering off the path. You end up not spending time with God, you end up not spending time in prayer, you start falling to those old tendencies and temptations as they arise, we're prone to wander. That's what this verse means. Be not deceived. Don't wander. Don't wander off the path. A different word, but a similar idea is mentioned. We've already looked at it here in Galatians. Galatians 3.1 says, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? Same idea. It's a different, different Greek word, but the same idea to be led astray, to get distracted. Who has distracted you? He goes on, that ye should not obey the truth. This was in the portion where the Apostle Paul kept saying, look, why would you give up the gospel of grace and try to be bound by the works of the law? Who hath bewitched you to make such a bad trade? The same idea here. Be not deceived. With the context of the whole epistle, this warning would certainly include a warning about the false teachers, the Judaizers, their, their false teaching. Don't be deceived by people who would come along and say, look, in addition to Christ, you also need X, Y, and Z. You need to fulfill the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to, you need to do these things. James 1.22, another well-known verse, gives us kind of another dimension to the idea of deceit. It says, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own self. We're only, we've got our guards up for other people, right? I'm not going to be deceived by, by this guy, while at the same time, we're telling ourselves, well, I'm doing okay. 
I've got my I've got my shield up from the outside, but I can deceive myself. We need to be careful. That's why God gives us his warning. He says, be not deceived. Don't, don't be deceived by others. Don't be led astray. Don't deceive yourself. He goes on with the warning. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Mocked means to ridicule, to turn up your nose at or to sneer. Mocking, if, if the, the NFL or in college football, that's unsportsmanlike conduct. Okay? Mocking. Okay? They don't like that. When, when some lineman, he just plants the quarterback in the field and he goes up to him and he thumbs his nose at him, what's going to happen? No, it's not going to go over. Why? Because he's mocking the guy, right? He's making fun of a guy who he just made one with the Astro turn. It's not okay. That's what this is. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Well, how can you mock God? Well, you, you turn up your nose. It would sound something like this. Now, we would never say it like this. The words would never come out of our mouth. And it's going to sound horrible when I say it. But listen, something to this effect. Yeah, yeah but I'll bet he judges sin. Because we see so much sin in our world, we think, do you see these people getting away with it? Hey, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Or something... We, we might would have this thought, well, I'm the exception. God doesn't expect me to give that up. That's mocking God. Mocking God is when I say, I, I know what God says, but I'm special. I know what God says, but I'm the exception. I know what God says, but he's not going to take sin seriously in this case. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You're not going to get away with it. If you watch football with any regularity, if you watch any sport, you, you will know very well that the refs don't catch everything. Okay? That happens pretty regularly. God catches everything. You're not going to get away with it. You're not going to get away with mocking God. It's likely, again, because of this dire warning that we begin with, that we view the rest of verse 7 in a negative light. So let's take a look at the rest of the verse. And I'm going to frame this as laws of the harvest. And I'm going to share with you four of them tonight, two from our, our text. Number one, and you know this. Now, I, I would be remiss to try to educate this, this congregation on harvesting in, in southeast Iowa. Okay? So, but this is biblical. Okay? What we're going to look at is the biblical laws of the harvest. They also apply when it comes to harvest of corn or soybeans or whatever it is you happen to be planting. Number one, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. This is the first law of the harvest. Verse 7, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If you want to harvest a particular thing, you begin by planting a particular thing. You, you have to plant it. If, if you were to go out here, now, I know there's volunteer corn and volunteer soybeans and all that, but if a farmer is, is up here at the gas station and you're talking to him, he says, I just, I'm so bent, bent out of shape over my crop this year. You say, what'd you plant? Well, I didn't. <laughs> then why are you upset? You're upset. You didn't plant. You reap what you sow. This principle is found throughout Scripture. Romans 2, verse 9. See if you can catch it in here. It's a, it, it might take you a second. It hit me. Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil. Of the Jew first and also of the Gentile, but glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good. Do you see the sowing and reaping? You do good. What do you get if you do good? You get glory, honor, and peace. What do you get if you do evil? You get tribulation, anguish. You, so you see the principle, it's found there. It's also found in Job 4, verse 8, we read, Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness reap the same. You reap what you sow. Paul further explains this principle in verse 8. Take a look. He says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. What's the flesh? Well, You've got it. I've got it. This, this is flesh. What you see right here before you. Romans 7, verse 8. 
the Apostle Paul uses this term very, very well to kind of help us define it. He says, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. There's a part of all of us, if you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you know there's a part of you that still likes sin. There's a part of you that hates sin, but there's a part of you that still goes that way. I've asked you before, why, why do we sin? Well, we sin because it's fun. Just to be real honest, and that, that grates on us a little bit, but the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but there is pleasure in sin. If every time you sin, you had a terrible body ache, you, you'd quit doing it. But the fact of the matter is, the body ache takes a little while to catch up sometimes. Okay? Sin has consequences. But our flesh, the, the part of us that, that we struggle with, it pulls that direction. It's prone to wander. The part of me that still pulls towards sin. Galatians 5.17, you can just look back, probably even on the same page, it says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. There's, there's the spirit of God within us who's, who's pulling us to do what's right, who's pulling us to do the will of God. And we have the flesh that's pulling us the opposite direction. These two are in constant opposition. We're told in verse 16, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But there's that conflict. There's tension constantly between the two. We're warned in 1 John 2, 16 about the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Why? Because it's a very, it's a very real part of our existence. The lust of the flesh is going to affect you tomorrow. Truth be told, the lust of the flesh is going to affect you yet tonight. Okay? You're going to face temptations to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's, that's Satan's playbook. They're going to be coming at you. But within us, we have the spirit. But the, we're talking about the flesh. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh Reap corruption. Romans 7, 19. The Apostle Paul kind of goes on in his explanation of the flesh. He says, for the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. There's the flesh. You say, I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to get victory over that habit. What's pulling you away from that decision? That's the flesh. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. The Apostle Paul, he kind of ends his, his, his cry in, in, in Romans 7. He says in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He's talking about the flesh. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This, this flesh that keeps pulling me in the direction that I shouldn't go. What's the harvest if I sow to the flesh? Well, he says, he shall of the flesh reap corruption. The word means ruin, rot, decay, destruction. Look back at the last chapter. Look at verse 19 of Galatians 5. Here it is. You sow to your flesh, you're going to start seeing these weeds pop up. They're going to look like this. They're going to be adultery and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. That's a pretty terrible list, isn't it? That's where the flesh will lead you. You say, not my flesh, your flesh. My flesh. This, this right here, what we just read, the works of the flesh, that's your flesh, that's my flesh. If you, if you give yourself enough rain, you'll be shocked at the depths you'll go to. If, if you say, you know what, I can do this thing on my own, you'll end up in this mess. It's, it's a fact. If you sow to the flesh, 
You'll love the flesh, reap corruption. But, he goes on, verse 8, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Well, that sounds a whole lot better, doesn't it? I'm not reaping corruption to my flesh. I sow to the Spirit. There's an alternative. We talked about Galatians 5, 17. The, the undying mortal enemy of the flesh is the Spirit. They're, they're contrary to one to the other. The flesh lusts against the Spirit. The Spirit against <coughs> the flesh. Galatians 5, 22. If you sow to the Spirit, if I walk in the Spirit, these fruit will be seen in my life. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Romans 8, 6. For to be carnally minded, that's fleshly. Carnal, you hear the, 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 same, the same root word, carnal, is the same word for flesh. To be fleshly minded, to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. To be, if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. You get life. You get peace. John 15, verse 5, the, the famous chapter about the vine and the branches says, I am the vine. This is Jesus speaking. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. What fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. The, the fruit of life and peace, not the fruit of corruption. Rather than the threat of a terrible harvest for those who sow to the flesh, there's a blessed promise to those who sow to the Spirit. Again, as I said, we often view this as a threat. Well, you reap what you sow. Well, we could also say, hey, you reap what you sow. If you sow to the Spirit, you will reap. The fruit of the Spirit. You'll reap life and peace and joy and true abiding happiness. It's not just a threat. The other side of that, that same coin is the promise. The first law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. <laughs> for better or for worse. The second law of the harvest. <clears throat> You'd say this is pretty, pretty obvious. You reap after you sow. You know how many farmer, farmers are getting a harvest right now? None around here. Why? Well, I didn't plant anything yet. You reap after you sow. Look at verse 9. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. There's a time element when it comes to sowing and reaping. You must sow first, and then you must wait and wait. And wait. And wait some more. It, there's, there's time. We'll reap if we faint not. He says, let us not be weary. It means to be utterly spiritless. To be worn out or exhausted. Why would, be, why would we be worn out or exhausted? Well, is, is it easy in 2023 in the United States of America? Is, do, do, you, do you feel the spiritual battle? That you're in? Does it ever wear you out? Don't be weary in well doing. That's what he says. Don't be weary. You're sowing to the Spirit so that you can reap life everlasting. So don't, don't get worn out. We tend to, though. That's why he said, that's why he gives us this, this warning. Don't be weary in well doing. Well doing just means doing right. You ever feel like the lost people around you who constantly sow to the flesh? Seem to be constantly getting ahead, but when you try to walk in the Spirit, it seems to be a constant uphill battle. That's where we live, isn't it? <laughs> that's, that's where the rubber meets the road. David had that thought, too. He said, I look at the wicked, and they're, they're constantly advancing. But if you remember later in that psalm, he says, Then I went to the house of the Lord, and I saw their end. <laughs> that's what we have to keep in mind. Paul knew this feeling well. But his encouragement to the believers in Galatia, don't quit, harvest is coming. If a farmer plants his fields in the spring and he doesn't see a harvest, he says, you know what, this is stupid. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna plow it again in July. Just, just gonna plow it up again. It's, no, 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 harvest is coming. 
brothers and sisters in Christ, harvest is coming. Don't get weary in well-doing. If you're walking in the Spirit, do what God says. Harvest is coming. He promises. It says, if you faint not. The word faint means to relax. To loose. You ever feel like that? I just, I just can't go on anymore. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at my wit's end. I, I can't fight this anymore. Don't faint. Why? Because harvest is coming. If, you, if we will reap, if we faint not. Our rest is in Christ. Deuteronomy 33, verse 27. The eternal God is thy refuge. And underneath are the everlasting arms. I almost never do this. I'm going to read to you a, a little bit longer of a quote. It's a poem that I found. I don't know anything about the author. But I want you to keep in mind what we've looked at, and I want you to, to hear what I'm saying in light of what we've looked at in Galatians 6, 7, okay? 6, 7 to 6, 9, okay? Listen as I read. I know it's hard. When, when a pastor says, listen while I read, it's easy to, okay, don't do that. Stay here. Here we go. It's called don't quit. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is queer with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a fellow turns about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Often the goal is nearer than it seems to a faint and faltering man. Often the struggler has given up when he might have captured the victor's cup. And he learned too late when the night came down how close he was to the golden crown. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt. And you never can tell how close you are. It may be near when it seems afar. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. And when things seem worse, you must not quit. That's what he's saying here. Don't be weary in well-doing. You say, but it's hard to do it. It's hard to walk in the Spirit. It's hard to say no to my flesh when my flesh is so loud. It's hard and I'm tired. Don't be weary in well-doing. Because in due season, we'll reap if we faint not. What will we reap? If we're sowing to the flesh, we'll reap corruption. But if we're sowing to the Spirit, will reap life everlasting. You reap what you sow. You reap after you sow. Let me give you the third and the fourth here very quickly. The third is, you reap more than you sow. How important is yield when it comes to harvest? Pretty important. It's everything. And you, you say, well, I got out just as much as I put in. <laughs> You should quit, right? <laughs> that, that's kind of a, 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 a cycle that will never end. If, if all you ever, now I know sometimes you, you have a bad year, but if it was all bad years where you just broke even, then you're wasting your time and a lot of diesel. A one-to-one -one ratio is not sufficient. Hosea speaks of this when it comes to people disobeying. It's true for sowing to the flesh or sowing to the spirit. He says in Hosea 8, 7, for they have sown the wind... And they shall reap the whirlwind. You ever meet somebody who sows to the flesh a little bit and they think, I, I've got this under control. And it comes and it just eats them alive. Because when we sow to the flesh, we're going to reap corruption. When it comes to sowing to the spirit and reaping the life everlasting, John 15 tells us that if we abide in him, we will bear much fruit. We've already looked at John 15, 5. John 15, 8 says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. You reap what you sow. You reap after you sow. You reap more than you sow. And this next one is very similar, but there's some difference. You reap in proportion to what you sow. You reap in proportion to what you sow. 
2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly. He which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Now this verse gets pulled by those who have a prosperity gospel a lot. And they use this verse out of context to have people send them seed money. <laughs> and they say, well, if you send me $20, God will send you 100 If you send me 100 God will send you 1000 So bountifully <laughs> to me, and, and, and God will bless you. <clears throat> That's taking this out of context. That's not what it's talking about. 2 Corinthians is written within the context of giving monetarily. So that's not out of bounds. Paul is taking collection for the suffering saints in Jerusalem. My goal is to produce an abundance of fruit. For the fruit of the Spirit. That's my goal. To walk in the Spirit and produce that fruit. It can only be done as I abide in Christ. It can only be done as I sow to the Spirit. But it should not be done with the mentality, maybe you've heard this, you probably even said it, even in joking. Well, you've done your good deed for the day? Have you ever heard that before? <laughs> Am I sowing bountifully if I say, well, you know what? I, uh, I poured Steph a cup of coffee, so good for the day. Did my good deed for the day. I don't have to worry about it. I can do whatever I want because I did my... No, so bountifully. So what bountifully? Well, if you look here at verse 10, back in our text, Galatians 2.10 as we have, therefore, opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. As we have, therefore, opportunity. This does not mean that we, we just kind of ride the flow. We say, well, I'm looking for opportunities to do, to do good things. This, this right here where it says, as we have, therefore, opportunity, it means while you have life. If you're breathing, then you have opportunity. You say, well, I don't have opportunity because I, I just stay in my house all day. Get out of your house and take advantage of the opportunity. That's what he says here. As we have, therefore, opportunity, every chance I get, I should do good unto all men. Laws say, I should do good unto all men. Give, give me the answer here. What's the greatest good I can do to a lost person? I can tell them about Jesus Christ. I can say, hey, uh, let, let, me, let me share the gospel with you. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. That's the greatest good that we can do for a lost person. <clears throat> but, but he goes on here in verse 10. He says, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Who's that talking about? Who, who should I be using all of my opportunities to do good for? You, right? you are of the household of faith. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I should be taking every opportunity. I should be doing good to, to the people who I walk by who I don't know. And especially, I should be doing good for the household of faith. John 13, 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one for another. Now, to put this into the context of, of Galatians 6. <clears throat> Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. How can I do good to them who are of the household of faith? I can love you towards Christ. I can, I can lovingly, if, if you step into sin, I'm going to lovingly come, as, come alongside of you, not in a spirit of pride, in a spirit of meekness, because I know they could just as easily be me, but I'm going to say, hey, you know what? Let, let me share something with you. And I'm going to lovingly edify you, build you up in the things of God. I want you to look like Jesus. You should want me to look like Jesus. And when we all get together, our goal is to love one another enough to help each other look like Jesus. That's what he's saying here. I look for the opportunities to show the love of Christ to all, but especially my brothers and sisters in Christ. So this evening, we started off with a warning. <coughs> Don't keep yourself by allowing yourself to be led into the error of thinking that God is not watching. 
Be not deceived. God is not mocked. God is watching, and he rewards good and punishes evil. It's a fact. You say, well, I don't see it. That doesn't make any difference. It's still a fact. God does see. God does reward good and punish evil. But remember the laws of the harvest that we've looked at here this evening. I'll give them to you here. You reap what you sow. You reap after you sow. Don't be weary in well-doing. You reap more than you sow. Bear much fruit. And you reap in proportion to what you sow. Seek opportunities. You say, well, I... I, I come to you, and I know this wouldn't happen. I come to you, I say, hey, when was the last time you sowed to the Spirit? You say, well, I did last week sometime. No, you, you should be sowing regularly, all the time. Every opportunity, you should be sowing to the Spirit. Reap, we reap in proportion to what you sow. I hope this kind of sheds a little bit, maybe a different light. I know you've, you've probably heard messages on this passage before. Again, I, I'm convicted when I read over this passage and I just view it as, ooh, better be careful. You reap what you sow. You should, but also take the promise. You reap what you sow. You know, if, if you spend a lot of time if you make it your goal to share the gospel with a lot of people, you know what you're probably going to see? You're going to see some people trust Christ. You know why? Because you're sharing the gospel. You're sowing bountifully. <laughs> the law of numbers is working for you. You know the people who you know who catch the most fish, literally? They're the people who go fishing the most often. <laughs> you know why I haven't caught a fish in a couple years? I haven't, I haven't put a line in water. Okay, That's what it comes down to. If you're going to, if you're going to sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. It's, it's God's law, the law of the harvest. I hope it'll be a blessing to you. Let's bow for a word of prayer here this evening. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this very well-known portion of Scripture. Lord, this portion where many times we view it as a threat, and Lord, there is caution to be taken, but I pray that we wouldn't miss the promise that if we'll sow to the Spirit, we'll reap life everlasting. Lord, I pray that that would be the case, that we would sow bountifully to the Spirit, Lord, that we would seek opportunities to love one another in the direction of your Son. Lord, we ask you to bless this week ahead. Help us, Lord, to honor and glorify you in all that we do and say. And we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name.